I want to um, I want to share a comment that I that I received this morning. It's kind of long. Um, it's kind of long, but I, I, I want to read it to you. And then I want to talk about it a little bit because it was really, it was really, really fascinating. And it's sort of, it sort of speaks to, to what we were saying about, um, it sort of speaks to what we're talking about as far as being people of love and, 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 and this, the enemy is, is actually, it's hate, you know, anyway. So the comment starts off, Reverend Ed, you seem like a nice guy. Oh, um, but, and you remind me of pastors that I knew when I was involved in the church, but I think the ship that you're worried about has already sailed. Mega has stolen your identity and stolen the attributes of Jesus. Megas are remaking Jesus into the image of Trump. I have heard mega preachers say that there is a side to Jesus that behaved like Trump. I've never heard that, but I find that horrific. They used... They use, for an example, when Jesus called the scribes and the Pharisees vipers and snakes in the way that Trump gives opponents dirty names. They are preaching that Jesus uh, has come as the biblical lion. Our Lord is no longer the Lamb of God. It's heartbreaking. I saw a pastor at a Trump rally give the prayer. In it, he said that Trump would be reelected and all who opposed him would face retribution. The political left will be punished because they have been given over to sin and demon worship. I fully, I personally fully expect to see these nightmares come to pass if Trump does seize the White House. I'm very old, and for most of my life, when someone identified as a Christian, or if someone identified another person as a Christian, that meant something very important. It told you that you were dealing with an honest a very honest, kind, and decent person. They were to be trusted. That's not how I react today. Frankly, I think I may be in for a tough time. There is a lot of anger and hatred in that identification. One day Trump will be gone, but what will be left of the church? The megas and Trump are hurting Christianity. Can it survive Trump? What will it be when Trump is gone? What will be left, excuse me, when Trump is gone? What will be left of the Republican Party? You could be the most dedicated Democrat in the country, but if you think, if you don't think that we need a strong and robust opposition party, you have the wrong idea of democracy. I hope the church will rise above mega. It has faced many challenges in the past. No matter what, what, it was wonderful to hear your message tonight. Thank you. So that was a comment made uh, on a video I did a little while ago about sort of about Christian nationalism, and um, the con- this comment means a lot. I mean, comments always mean a lot to me when I get a chance to read them. But I, I really liked it, and and I love the questions that they ask towards the end of the comment. One day Trump will be gone. What will be left of the church? The megas and Trump are hurting the church. Can it survive Trump? What will be left when Trump is gone? What will be left of the Republican Party? I don't know if I can answer that last one terribly accurately. I don't know. My sense is that... Um, my sense is when you see big political shifts like this within a party... Um, it re- either raises them up into a place of power or it destroys them. And given what I have seen recently about how many in the Republican Party, uh, and I use that term fairly loosely, but people who would identify as mega or Republican or at least, um, you know, sort of the right wing side of politics, that they are, they are ripping and tearing at each other. Um, It's no longer enough that they rip and tear at their political opposition. They're actually ripping and tearing at themselves. My guess would be when this is all over, there won't be much left to the Republican Party. And that um, as as far as a unified party is concerned, with a unified platform and, and a unified 
direction and vision. There won't be much left. Um, it'll take years. It'll take years to recover, maybe decades to recover. But as for the church, there's a prayer we pray every week during Lent that I absolutely love. And it's absolutely terrifying, but it's absolutely something that every member of the church should should digest and allow to to mean something to them. And the prayer goes, uh, it, we, we say it when we break the bread at communion. And uh, the second half of the prayer says, let your church be the wheat which bears its fruit in dying. There are many metaphors. There are many, many, many metaphors in the New Testament in particular where Jesus describes the church and the congregation and believers. He describes them like plants, right? The vine and the branches and and the fig trees that he mentions and and the wheat that he mentions. These are all these are all things that he uses to describe the church. And uh, you know he talks about he talks about harvesting, and he talks about pruning, and he talks about how a how a, a stalk of wheat must die, and when it dies, it produces sixty, eighty, a hundred times, you know. It's, it's yield. So my, I believe, I believe that everything that this, this commentator, I think that they're right. I think the church, um, because of how the, how the brand is being hijacked and has been hijacked for like 40, 50 years, you know, to progressively more and more and more hijacked and, uh, and, and we've gotten a progressively worse and worse and worse reputation because of how uh, a very small, not a very small, but a smaller, the, the, the minority of us have been acting and have been speaking and have been behaving. That the church's reputation is, 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 it's entirely possible that when all this is said and done, it'll be in shambles. And it's not going to be because some government put things in place to, to, to squash our rights, it's going to be because we acted badly. We've acted horribly. And, and I say that from my own perspective as well, because maybe, maybe we didn't do enough as a church and as church leaders, maybe we didn't do enough to stand up and differentiate ourselves from those who are making a mockery of, of the one we claim died for us, rose for us, and was and ascended for us, the one that we're supposed to follow. We've not done anything to stand up and, and separate ourselves, at least in the public's in the public eye, from from who these well heretics who these heretics are. But the church, the church is bigger than buildings. The church is even bigger than congregations. The church rests on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is awesome. You don't hear too many people speak badly of what Jesus actually said. What he actually did. And what he calls us to do. So, I believe that no matter what comes, no matter what damage is done, the church will be stronger because of it. That it, This will be a season of pruning. This will be a season of withering. This will be a season of, of death. But it's in those seasons that the church, I think, has the greatest opportunity to show the world who it truly is and, and who it truly serves. It's, it's in these kinds of moments that the church 
has the greatest opportunity to be the friggin' church. And it's been centuries, right? Make no mistake about it. The church, when it was persecuted, was powerful. It lost that power when it became institutional. The church, when it was under attack, was dangerous. And I mean dangerous to the powers that be. It, 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 the church was a force of liberation, and it was a force of good, and it was a force of love, and it was a force of, of, of community. When it was, when it was under pressure, when it was under attack, when it became institutional, it became something else. So, you know, coming back to the questions, what will be left of the church? It may be in shambles, but the prayer is let the church, may the church be the wheat which bears its fruit in dying. So as we are in shambles, help us to grow strong and become what it is we're supposed to be. Right? Can it survive? Yeah, it'll survive Trump. And it'll survive the next guy. And it'll survive the guy after that. And it'll survive the person after that. The church will survive because the church is greater than, than any human characteristic of it. What will be left when Trump is gone again? It's impossible nothing will be left. It's also... This is just me talking. It's also possible that it's also possible that the church needs to find itself back in a situation where it has nothing. Amen.